Well, good morning. I'm David from Arbor Grove United Methodist Church in Perlier, North Carolina. I'm glad you stopped by for a few minutes. If this is your first visit with us, we're tickled to death that you came. If you tune it in often, then it warms our heart to know that you want to share God's word and time and spirit with us for a few minutes. If you're just getting ready for church uh, at your own home facility, then you just keep right on brushing your teeth and combing your hair if you've got enough hair to comb and uh, share some worship time with us even while you're on your way to church. This is our 30th week of devotional time for everyone that's interested and Miss Ann, who videos the broadcast, myself and all of Arbor Grove, hope that something here helps draw you closer to God and to each other in the coming week. You know, week before last, while I was on my usual journey as a road musician, I felt that God was prodding me to go visit Matthew chapter 5 for a few weeks. And in particular, the verses that are known to us as the Beatitudes. These are in uh, Matthew, as I say, chapter 5, and, and they start out what we call the Sermon on the Mount. It goes for many pages, and you need to read the whole thing. But in particular, studying some of the verses uh, singularly, I think, helps us get a, a good understanding of what Christ was uh, preaching and teaching about on that mountainside. So in our devotional time this past Sunday, we studied about the first one of these in the list that concerns the poor in spirit. And when combined with some similar uh, scripture from Isaiah, and let's see, we got some from Psalms and Proverbs, we find poor in spirit seems to mean having humility and what's called uh, a contrite heart with God and man. Jesus mentions the result of being poor in spirit. He says that those that are poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So that's a desirable trait with a desirable outcome. If you notice in each one of the Beatitudes, Jesus would make a statement about uh, a human trait or an attitude of some kind, and then he would follow it with the consequences of having and displaying this trait. In other words, he would say, blessed are they that do this or have this, and then he would follow it with the reward for being this way. So this week, we're going to look at two more of these statements. We're going to go down to verse 4, Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. And it says, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Well, no one wants to mourn. Mourn means you're sad. But how many ways have you seen people mourning? Sometimes it's necessary. Or have you experienced mourning yourself? I guarantee you, you probably have. Uh, everyone does. No matter how happy you are, and I know some very happy people. I'm usually pretty happy myself. Uh, some things in life can still make you incredibly sad. Uh, and some things can cause you to cry inside, if not on the outside. You know, when it's a terrible situation like the loss of a friend or a loved one or a terrible pain from some in injury or disease or the loss of a, maybe a lifetime's work or possessions, in a house fire or a tornado, the inevitable follow-up to that is mourning. M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, mourning in some form. And the worst mourning is when you feel like there is no way out and no light at the end of the tunnel. Friends, let me tell you something. Christians, true Christians, no matter how hard and dejected the situations may become, suffer though they may, they still have that light at the end of the tunnel. And that's the promise of eternal life in the presence of God by way of Christ's sacrifice for us, God's grace and that sacrifice. Paul brought this to mind when he said to the Corinthians, if we didn't have Christ beyond this life here and beyond our pains and sorrow that can come our way here, then we're just the most miserable of people. If Christ isn't forever, not just on this earth, but 
but forever. We would be totally miserable. What would there be to look forward to? This life's short. That's why, <clears throat> excuse me, that's why when you come to Christ and ask him into your heart and to guide your life, you immediately want to tell somebody else about it. You're concerned about them. They, you want them to know about this good thing that you found, particularly somebody that doesn't know about him or someone that maybe knows him but needs reminding or reassuring that our mourning or their mourning here is temporary, like this life is temporary. You know, old Satan would have us mourning both in this life and the next because of our sin. Jesus gives us the light, the way out of condemnation because of our sin. No wonder that Jesus said, if you're mourning, you will be comforted. Let me ask you, does any of you have a comforter on your bed? I like them things. Uh, discovered them many years ago. Best kind of quilt you've ever seen. And uh, on a cold night, if the heat goes out, don't that thing warm you up? Uh, ain't you glad you got it? I mean, I would be and have been. Wouldn't you be mourning if you were laying there with your teeth chattering in the cold? Now you know how the homeless feel. Think about that a little bit. Well, Jesus promised before he left this earth the first time that he would send a comforter in our time of need and mourning. And I don't think it's a blanket or a quilt, but it can be even more comforting than them because it's permanent. His warmth, his comfort never goes away because it is the eternal spirit of God. So if you're in a bad place today, if for whatever reason you are sad, dejected, or hurting, uh, lonely maybe, in other words, if you're mourning, just remember that Jesus says you're blessed and you shall be comforted. You just can't get that great comfort without him. Let him put his arms around you and make your situation so much better. One other of the Beatitudes we'll talk about today is in verse 5 of chapter 5. Verse 5 said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, to begin with, this whole earth was made and given to us as the human race by God himself. Genesis tells us this. Unfortunately, because of our pride, our desire to be God instead of wanting to obey God, we lost the best part of it in the Garden of Eden. If we're proud, folks, we're not meek. Meek means to realize that we're not in charge. Meek means that we're willing to obey instead of rebel the Lord against the Lord. As Americans sometimes, as much as I love being an American, sometimes we have a hard time with that one because we're a little rebellious by nature, and you know that. Yet only our meekness to God and our trust in him has allowed our nation to survive this far. I believe that. And we seem to be forgetting lately how to be meek with God and with other people. The strongest person physically and mentally is only a complete person if they understand the nature of being subordinate to God and concerned for others beyond concern for themselves. That's meekness. And Jesus says that to be that way is to regain the earth that we lost in the garden. There's a new heaven and a new earth coming. The Word of God says that. I want to inherit a better situation in a new heaven and a new earth. Whatever it is that God's got in store, I want it to be better than where we're at now. You know, God illustrates this in two books in the Old Testament, in the book of Kings and in the book of Chronicles. He paints a picture of this. When he allows the Babylonians to come conquer the proud, sometimes rebellious, southern kingdom of Judah, that lower part of what was once Israel, when the Babylonians killed off many of God's people there, they took others captive to Babylon, and they only left a few of the lowly farmers and the poor of the land 
to be vine dressers, they called them. Vine dressers. In other words, just laborers to keep up the fields. Gardeners for what was left of the land. In other words, the meek. The meek were there before the fight. The meek were there after the fight. And after 70 years of captivity, later when God allows the captives to come back and rebuild the land and the temple, the vine dressers, the meek, they were there, those that were left. They had in truly, they had truly inherited the land. They were there to meet them when they came back. You know, today as we think about our lives and our relationship to God, our country, our land is in a rebellious state, not just politically, although that can be destructive enough, but we're rebellious toward God and his direction for our lives. Folks, he made us. He made the earth. He constructed the model, and he knows how it all works. And he's given us the owner's manual and the road map. And we can either read it and accept it and accept Christ as our Savior, or we can make the same mistakes that Adam and Eve did over and over, putting our will in front of God's will, and the result will be the same. But this time, instead of being banished like they were banished from the garden and having to struggle for centuries to find our way back uh, to him in meekness and submission, this time, when he comes back for the second time, is the time of no return. To continue to reject him now is to inherit eternal punishment instead of eternal life. Thank God for his word Thank God for his grace and thank God for verse five that tells us how to avoid this, how to be blessed when we are poor in spirit, when we mourn and when we choose to be meek with God and others. Jesus loves us. He died for us. And if we want to be strong today, then let's do it with his strength. Let's rely on him. Let's trust in him. Let's call on him. And let him lead the way. Amen. One other thing today as we close. I don't know what your political leaning is, and it's none of my concern right now. But what is of my concern is the life of our president, his wife, and all of our other leaders that have come down with this virus. And there may be some more. I'm sure there probably will be before this is over. We may agree or disagree with their ideology and leadership, but the Bible says that our concern should first be for their lives and for their well-being. Jesus did that. So it's okay for us to do it as well. Please pray for President Trump, his wife Melania, and all of our leaders, regardless of party affiliation. Let's pray for our nation as a whole today like we've never done it before. Speaking of leaders and champions, here's a song about the greatest one. Uh, God gave me this song many, many years ago in the middle of a snowstorm that had knocked out the power in our community for about three days, and I guess it was a good time for him to get me to shut up and sit down and write. So uh, he brought me this, and uh, it talks about a true champion, a true leader, one that uh, we can't do without. When Adam and Eve believed on the lies of Satan in the garden that day, it seemed all was lost. How great was the cost, the wages of sin they would pay. Then judgment was passed that all men must die. It seemed that all hope was in vain. But a champion was waiting before time began. Now into the battle he came. And Jesus came to the rescue when he fought the battle. Savior 
came Whoa, to the rescue our Savior came Today like old Adam sometimes we will stray and fall into Satan's dark plan That's when we should turn and give up all our will to a leader who's more than a man. Oh, and Jesus came to the rescue. When he fought the battle, we won the war. Although we were sinners and surely to blame, to the rescue our Savior came. God bless every one of you. Hope you have a great day in the Lord. Hope you have a safe time this week. Hope to see you next week. Bye-bye.